Hello, folks. How is everyone doing? Good conference so far? Very good. So I was listening to the bio for, uh, for uh, Sudeep, the previous speaker, and it uh, looks like he went through like 10 different companies in 10 years. And I'm thinking, you know, I spent the last 18 years at IBM. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? But then he said one thing which really um, was interesting. He said, no offense, but you guys have suddenly because started becoming cool. No, okay, I'll take that. <laughs> because, you know, you guys are doing open source, you guys are, are catering to developers, I'll take that. Thank you, Sudeep. So, um, in my um, role now, I actually travel a lot, I meet with customers, and work with them on real machine learning use cases. Um, <clears throat> so, going beyond um, the, uh, the theoretical stuff to actual implementations. And I want to share some perspectives with you and also what I see in terms of the huge role that open source is playing in advancing the technologies here. <clears throat> now, um, I'm sure, you know, pretty much everyone knows the fundamentals, um, but I'll take maybe a minute. Um, <clears throat> what is machine learning? There is the, uh, the definition on Wikipedia that goes all the way back to 1959. You know, you know computers that learn without being explicitly programmed. It was Arthur Samuel from uh, the time when he built the, uh, the checker program right, at IBM. You know, computers that learn automatically sounds kind of like Skynet. Uh, so I tend to describe this in, 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 in my terms. I say, you know, it's basically about understanding patterns in data using algorithms. Now, it goes a little bit beyond that. You may have structured data, you may have unstructured data, and you're essentially trying to find patterns and insights in that data, and then maybe, in certain cases, use, those, use that understanding to predict what's gonna happen. So you, you, you know about supervised and unsupervised. Supervised when you have um, uh, labeled data um, with known outcomes, so has fraud already happened? Your, does your historical data already have that information? Was a cross-sell offer successful? So if you have that historical known outcome data, you use that to create a model, understand patterns, and use that to predict. And then unsupervised where you, know, you don't even know um, what the um, outcomes were, and you're asking the algorithms to try and understand the relationship between uh, different parts of the data, understand clusters. Okay. So that is the basics. <clears throat> now, as, as I interact with customers, what I see is uh, very um, innovative and interesting use cases. So some of these are obvious ones, like in the finance industry, fraud detection is, is like the number one thing. Any bank you walk into, this is the number one thing that they want to focus on. Now, going from batch scoring of, um, of credit card transactions to in-transaction in real-time scoring predicting fraud. There are other very interesting use cases, healthcare, right? So um, using the ABCs uh, and uh, predicting um, uh, you know, the chance or likelihood of, um, you, um, of a patient becoming diabetic, uh, preventive um, uh, interventions, um, um, trying to avoid emergency room visits by predicting uh, certain lifestyle um, um, uh, outcomes. These are all um, happening um, as we speak uh, across, across uh, industries. I, I thought I'll share a couple of these um, and also uh, then start talking about um, the role of uh, Spark that I see happening in here. So this is, a, this is an interesting one. This is not a traditional industry. This is a company that works with inner city buildings, inner city uh, uh, businesses in improving the energy efficiency of the building. So they will work with nonprofit organizations, churches, and the like, and help those, uh, those businesses understand the energy profile of their building and help optimize it. Their current model is that they will send an engineer or a couple of engineers. They go out and uh, they sit down and they measure and they talk and interview the superintendent of the building and collect a lot of data. And then they've got a pretty sophisticated model which, uh, which tries to calculate what is called the energy um, unit um, the, the efficiency of the building, uh, EUI. And, and then it comes back into, okay, how can I improve this and so on. There's a problem with this. Sending engineers to each and every nonprofit is not a very scalable model. The uh, nonprofits and churches usually cannot afford that initial assessment in, 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 in a few thousand dollars range. 
And they want to scale this. They want to scale this operation. Now, the way they did this is, and, it, and this, is a, this is an actual um, thing that they have rolled out, is very interesting. Instead of sending engineers, they make a mobile app available to the building superintendent. So the building superintendent has this app on their phone, and instead of asking and answering a bunch of questions, you know, you start the app, and um, the app tells him to go outside and take a picture of the building from outside. Then go down to the basement and take a picture of the boiler. Take a picture of the, uh, the heating system. Take a picture of the cooling system. And all of this information is uploaded into, um, into the environment, and basically, pieces of information are extracted from these images, fed into a machine learning model, and it comes back with a score of what, how efficient this building is. And then, if you want further intervention, if you want the company to go out and improve the energy efficiency, that's when they engage. So, at the fringe, at the, uh, at the, at the mobile app level, you know, that is using deep learning to understand the visual images, you know, things like, oh, um, you know, that building is made of stone and it's got large windows and it's got a high ceiling to uh, base ratio and is, uh, does not have a lot of shade on the sides. These are all being extracted out through um, custom uh, visual recognition uh, um, uh, models. And then it builds a set of profiles or attributes in, in machine, uh, language, machine learning uh, lingo. It is actually building out the feature set that is going to be used to score against the model that has been built and deployed, coming back with a score. Very interesting use case. Um, <clears throat> next one is, is, uh, is another interesting one, what we call a celebrity experience. So in here, the idea is that um, you have core trans, oh, by the way, that's a mainframe. You know, it's an IBM keynote, right? I got to put a mainframe up there somewhere. Um, but all kidding apart, you know, this is where most of the enterprises have your core transactional data. The question is, how will you use that data in new and interesting ways? So what, what uh, this scenario is about is, you know, you've got your transactional history, you've got credit card transaction data there, volumes of it. So you kind of have an understanding of how, this, how customers are using credit cards. But couple that with other data, social media data, so, um, weather data, et cetera, and build in real time offers for the customer as they are transacting with the bank. You know, what, what we call a celebrity experience. Forrester uses that phrase, celebrity experience, where the end user feels that he's a celebrity, that the, the business knows him personally and is not treating him as a segment, but is treating him as an individual with an understanding of what his likes and dislikes are. Um, so lots of, lots of um, variations of this in the retail industry, in banking, and so on, where you target offers or to provide a customized experience to your end user through uh, using machine learning. Now, machine learning itself is not new, so what exactly is different now? Right, so I think there are three major forces that are uh, coming together to make this happen. If you go about this in reverse order from what is on the screen, availability of different types of data. You had transactional data all along, but now when you, when you supplement that with other types of data, for example, call center records. Who would have thought call center records could be a valuable, it's a, it's a treasure trove of information that can be used to couple with your transactional data. Social media, you know, Twitter or what, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Blogs, whatever the, your customer has put out there in the social sphere. These things become additional data that can be brought into enhancing your model. Now, external data may not always enrich your model. It is, an, it is typically a data scientist's job to see if adding external data enriches your data, enriches your model, and improves the accuracy or performance of the model. Advances in compute performance and a wave of open language. Let's talk about, a little bit about that. If you look at um, about a decade ago, <clears throat> as I said, machine learning itself is not new, but what most enterprises spend their dollars were in, was in the infrastructure needed to run those algorithms. The, com the amount of money spent on compute and storage was huge, and there was not enough money left for investing in where the actual heart of the matter was, the algorithms. But now, with advances in compute and storage technology, that is not the challenge uh, per se. You have much more room, much more um, uh, headroom to invest in, in terms of your actual algorithms and actual development. Especially with advances in GPU technology for deep learning, 
um, especially coupling that with your standard processes. You're all probably familiar with the, um, um, with the uh, GPUs from NVIDIA and how that can be, part, that can be paired with uh, standard processor technology. For example, with the power processors coupled with um, NVIDIA using the NVLink, an order of magnitude uh, improvement in performance, right? So you've got much more um, ability to innovate in the actual algorithms and the, and the neural nets and so on. Um, and the other part that's happening is that data science has become a team sport. It used to be, especially if you're doing SPSS or SAS or one of the existing technologies, it was a very contained space. You needed a PhD to understand that space. And, well, I'm just kidding, you don't need a PhD, but you know, you, 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 need, you needed to have extreme expertise in that specific area. And it was very difficult for the business analyst, the app developer, the data engineer to collaborate on machine learning projects. Now where the industry is headed is this collaborative idea, team sport, where all of these people can collaborate. So the concept of democratization is catching on. Um, and at the, at the sort of the star in this gallery of players is uh, Apache Spark. So you've got many different open source uh, offerings and frameworks and languages out there. You got um, uh, TensorFlow for deep learning. You got uh, Scikit-Learn. Spark is becoming uh, sort of a star in this, in this gallery of players for machine learning. And, and, and IBM has um, very consciously embraced this. We, are, we have made a commitment to embrace Spark. And we are doing that commitment in, one of, in, in two ways. The first one is a commitment to contribute to this ecosystem. The second is a, co is a commitment to adopt. So if you look at the first one, the commitment to contribute, this is where we talk about um, the Spark Technology Center. It's an investment where we've got a bunch, bunch of developers who are constantly, their only job is to produce code that is contributed to the Spark ecosystem. Um, if you look at some of the things that have um, happened, you know, some of the metrics, you know, um, lines of code contributed to Spark, um, you know, um, the number of commits in Spark 2.0, et cetera, and the increase in the level of contribution to the Spark ecosystem, it is incredible. I believe we are the number one contributor to this ecosystem right now, uh, especially in the machine learning space. And if you look at the top three contribution areas, you'll see that there is Spark SQL itself, then there is PySpark, so Python is the most popular language for, well, one of the most popular languages for uh, machine learning, and uh, uh, bringing the Python and Spark environments together with PySpark is, is a large area of contribution, and the ML libraries themselves. These are the top three of our contributions amongst the, 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 um, um, the overwhelming um, in, 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 um, high contributions to the uh, overall Spark ecosystem. So that is the commitment to contribute, and that will continue. Um, but we also have a commitment to adopt. It is not just that we write code and, and, and uh, donate it. We actually are embracing this internally, off-premises, on-premises, on the cloud, on the mainframe. I was not joking about the mainframe, by the way. It, was, it is actually the first on-premises platform that we put uh, Spark on and put uh, broad machine learning on. Um, so um, on, 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 ma on mainframes, on other uh, hard hardware platforms, um, in uh, connectors to various data sources, um, Spark connectors, uh, cloud services, um, you have Spark as a service. In two clicks, you can get um, a Spark service provision for you. You, can, um, you have uh, data science experience, which is a platform for data scientists, which makes uh, machine learning easy um, uh, and, and brings a collaborative team sport effort uh, to, uh, um, to the data science. Um, if you look at uh, data science experience and what we are doing there, I would, if you have not tried that out, I would highly recommend that. Go on uh, datascience.ibm.com and try that out. Um, you, you get a, a variety of options to play around with data science and machine learning constructs, both hardcore programmatic approaches in Jupyter Notebooks, as well as visual guided interfaces that let you play with um, these environments. If, you, if, you, if you're building ML models, it'll actually guide you through the process of creating ML models. You, you select and choose between different options in a dropdown, you, you try out your, your data, you look at the accuracy that is coming out of, the, of, out of the models and pick and deploy one. And the deployment is actually pretty cool. Now in, in one click, a model gets deployed into a Spark environment, but beyond that, we get to this concept of operationalizing. Uh, what, what I mean by that is, 
if you, if you have deployed your model, it's well and good, it performs great, area under the rock curve is great, or uh, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's wonderful, but a week from now, the model starts degrading, and you don't know what's going on. So the concept of constantly monitoring the model, looking at the performance of the model, and providing that as a feedback loop into, in, in a close feedback, so that the model can constantly be retrained if you need to, is a pretty interesting aspect, pretty interesting concept. So that the model that you build today and performs well today continues to perform well six months from now as new data comes in and as new patterns evolve in your data. This concept of deploy, monitor, constantly improve your model is, is something that I would suggest that you take a look at. Um, and Spark basically allows this connectivity to different data sources, provides a pipeline for your ML, but it also enables very interesting use cases. Blockchain um, is another hot topic these days. So here is an example where we are using Spark connectors into the data that is held in a blockchain environment. This happens to be a supply chain blockchain. Um, so we are looking at um, supply chain data and, and trying to understand or predict delays in shipments. So um, a shipment delays could happen because of a lot of different things related to the supply chain itself. It could be related to the things that are being shipped. Uh, it could be the carrier, it could be a destination and uh, uh, source, it could be time of shipment, it could be external uh, uh, things like weather. So using machine learning in the context of this data uh, made possible through Spark. So Spark allows you to connect to the underlying data sources bring it into DSX, the data science experience, understand factors contributing to the delays and shipments, and then build an ML model that can be used to predict whether there will be a delay, as well as what the delay will be. Right? Interesting use cases evolving. Um, and finally, one word about Watson. Um, so Watson is a set of uh, cognitive functions in terms of um, um, speech recognition, language, um, understanding natural language, um, image recognition and so on. So what do they two have in common? We see, a, we see many customer use cases where the friend and interaction uses one or more of Watson's um, cloud-based services. So for example, um, call center records. So speech to text happening at the call center, which are then used to extract pieces of information, build a model, uh, build, a, build a set of features, which are then fed into the model to do a scoring real time, and then guide the call center discussion. Right? So speech to text in the front end using Watson coupled with a Spark ML model in the back end coming together. So the concept of um, uh, hardcore machine learning processing on Spark coupled with pre-built deep learning services on Watson uh, makes some very interesting uh, cognitive applications. I want to end there. I, my time has run out. I'm happy to uh, discuss offline. Um, I would highly encourage you to take a look at some of these things. Machine learning and data science uh, URLs are here. Uh, free, feel free to uh, to play around. All right, thank you for your time. <laughs>